Welcome back to Global Business Report. Investment management firm Cardinal Stone has released its 2021 outlook for Nigeria entitled Awaiting Dawn. The title of the report draws inspiration from the Irish poem Second Coming, written in the aftermath of the First World War in 1919 amid a rampaging flu pandemic. But how important is vaccination to the economic fortune of the world and all the nations that inhabit it? Joining us to answer this question is Philip Anebe, Head of Research at Cardinal Stone. Good morning, Philip. It's good to have you here. Philip? Yeah, yeah, good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, good, good morning. Thank you very much. It's good to have you. Uh, your report uh, says the economic fate of the world now rests on the success of vaccine distribution. It also says there is a broad expectation skewed in favor of a V recovery. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, we think that um, the projections for uh, increased vaccine distribution in the second half of the year uh, could actually help to uh, drive an easing of uh, containment measures, as well as increase business confidence level. Now, you find out that it's also cheaper to go the vaccine route than uh, try to bankroll another round of um, stimulus programs. Uh, in 2020, for instance, Nigeria uh, borrowed over $2.3 trillion in the domestic market, this according to the NSC as well as try to, uh, as well as gather a further $4.9 billion from both the IMF and the World Bank. So it's not easy to stimulate the economy. So getting vaccine should be very important for us in 2021. In addition to that, a failure to get uh, the right number of vaccines to go around the population, you may find that it will increase the risk of job losses, uh, further uh, bankruptcy, and of course social unrest. So these are factors that could actually uh, negatively affect the economic outcome for the year. Uh, as important as vaccines are to economic recovery, Philip, uh, your report states that vaccination in Nigeria is a long way off. Why is that? What's your rationale? Yeah, we think that, yeah, we think that there's no uh, clear uh, court strategy for vaccines. Uh, we are not seeing uh, enough uh, campaigns on vaccines. And of course, our refrigerating capacity domestically is not as uh, robust as you would want it to be. I think recent reports suggest that we can house over about uh, 400,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine at uh, two uh, doses per individual. So that's about 200,000 Nigerians. So that's a long way to go. So we think that you still have to uh, invest in uh, refrigerating capacity to actually support uh, the drive. In addition to that, uh, COVAX has promised uh, free vaccination for about 20% of the population. But that is going to take place in the medium to long term or the near to medium term. So it's not immediate. And of course, it's also subject to availability of funding. So for Nigeria to actually fast track the process, we may need to do uh, some internal spending. So we think that there's still some way to go in this uh, fight to get off the current crisis. Uh, but, but your report also projects that Nigeria's economy will rebound to a growth of 1.5% this year, but also says that's not enough. And you talk about six important sectors that are critical to the, to the, na to the nation. What sectors are, are these and why do you uh, highlight them? Yeah, um, we think that 1.5% uh, uh, growth is not enough. It's still way below uh, potential GDP growth of, for Nigeria, which we estimate as above 4%. And we think that six sectors are critical for growth. They include agri-trade, uh, telecoms, manufacturing, crude oil, and real estate. Uh, as of 9 June 2020, we discovered that these sectors constituted about 76% of the economy and accounted for about 68% of the contraction. I uh, go back to 2016 recession, you discovered that these sectors or the changes in these sectors also contributed or reflected the overall decline in the economy. And so also was the recovery that we saw in 2017. So we are thinking that given their size or the proportion of GDP that they enjoy, they will again be critical for uh, 2021 growth outcome. So, uh, this, uh, <clears throat> your report, uh, Nigeria's debt, talking about one big story, uh, uh, one major uh, headline, uh, which was debt accounting for 40% of the 13 trillion budget funding, and, and, that total, and that total debt service of Federation Revenue has been elevated over the last years. What, what risk are we facing with this level of debt, uh, Philip? How grave is the no, situation of things? Yeah, whenever you talk about um, debt service to revenue, what comes to your mind is the issue of uh, sustainability. So uh, is the debt level sustainable? One, is even the growth you are trying to drive sustainable? So two factors. 
just the way you look at the company's uh, ROE accretion over the years and you ask yourself what really is driving the ROE accretion. Is it cooperations or is it a relatively risky and unsustainable leverage? So you prefer cooperations to drive performance. This is the same with Nigeria. If you continue to uh, increase debt without necessarily uh, channeling those debt into productive ventures, what you find is that the interest and uh, principal payment on those debts may come back <coughs> around future generations. I think that's the fear that people are like. But in any case, we think that we need this debt at this time, given the crisis, we need this debt. But then what is important is what we do with the debt that we obtain, obtain help address the coronavirus crisis, help invest in a really productive sector that we ensure a very good income stream into the future. Um, in terms of how we can mitigate this, do you see any other options here, funding options that we can take? Well, there are talks about uh, selling some um, assets that are not necessarily doing very well in the hands of government. Maybe private uh, initiatives can help to actually drive uh, better performance for those assets. In addition to that, we also believe that uh, a more pro-market stance of the government is slightly in economic recovery and also encourage FBIs and FDIs into the market. Uh, pro market stance could mean a relatively uh, flexible approach to currency pricing. It could mean greater privatization, like I hinted. It could also mean uh, trying to increase uh, regulatory arbitrage opportunities, making sure that regulation here does not prevent uh, potential investors from looking into the market. And of course, try to uh, 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 better the uh, ease of doing business in the, in the domestic space. Uh, what, what role do you think the markets, the, the debt capital markets or the equity capital markets can play in supporting uh, the government here? Well, we think that uh, the markets can uh, play the uh, role of uh, providing the necessary funding or the needed uh, funding to support uh, growth drive. Uh, thankfully, we've seen that the yields have been uh, at suppressed level for quite some time. That has actually encouraged a few companies to actually restructure uh, their balance sheet. They've actually, uh, some of them have front-loaded uh, debts, especially those companies that have long-term projects. So with yields at relatively attractive levels, you may find companies or sectors actually uh, getting enough funds to actually uh, bankroll their long-term projects, which uh, by extension is positive for uh, government revenue and overall uh, stimulation. Uh, but then you want to say that um, uh, more needs to be done. We need to encourage uh, far more uh, participation of private individuals. And we also need to encourage the FDIs to come in because the savings rates relative to GDP here is very low. So you need assistance or support from uh, the FDIs in our view. I just understand why the savings rate is just so low. And, and this is this domestic capital mobilization by the government. Yes, government do mobilize domestic uh, funds in terms of treasury bills, in terms of bonds and whatever. But why is it difficult to get this uh, uh, a local uh, um, uh, 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 savings mobilized for, for critical uh, development? Yeah, we think the reward for passing with liquidity is very low in Nigeria. It's not attractive enough. Uh, yields are at very uh, low, level, low, low levels. Uh, the interest on savings deposit is also very low. Uh, we know recently the uh, adjustments to NPR has uh, implications for uh, uh, yields on uh, savings deposits. So those factors, so reward for passing the liquidity, not at very decent levels. So, and of course, there's also generally that uh, low uh, savings culture across the populace. And, and in terms of uh, how the, the government can support the, the private sector to get this done, this in terms of the uh, public-private sector a partnership. What, what, what do you think is missing in, in this uh, particular engagement that you actually be the front runner of the entire uh, uh, game-changing economic growth that we're talking about? I would think that it's important to uh, drive uh, increased financial inclusion. I look at um, various FINAS studies that were recently done. You discovered that financial inclusion is still uh, very low, right? A number of the populace or a large chunk of the populace are still not banked. Then you don't have a pool of savings in one place that you can access uh, to actually drive uh, some other functions. So you start to try to encourage uh, greater financial inclusion. I think the CBN is making some strides on this front, but then more uh, has to be done. 
And then you also want to leverage uh, the technologies that are already existing. We see the telecom guys, they have really very broad reach. Can they uh, be leveraged to uh, better uh, the financial inclusion situation? We think there may be some scope uh, if some sort of collaboration is forged between uh, the authorities and those uh, players. Okay, so let, let's talk a bit about the market. What, what are your projections, headline projections for the current year? Let's start on the equity side. Yeah, for equities market, we are thinking that uh, returns will be relatively subdued. We don't think you are going to see anything closer to the 50% that we did in 2020. And that's on the back of um, expectations of relatively contained liquidity levels. You would agree with me that the bulk of the rally was last year was inspired by a liquidity uh, glut or deluge, basically. Uh, but this year, we expect liquidity uh, to be relatively more contained. Over maturities are expected to... Uh, moderates uh, beginning from Q2. In addition to that, we expect some sort of um, yield reversals. We are seeing yields go up, but then we expect yields to uh, pick up pace in Q2 on the back of the reduced liquidity. And then you expect some corrections in some overpriced stocks. Some stocks are currently overpriced. You may see corrections in those things. And put all of them together, you expect, you put all these factors together, you expect that implication will amount to a more modest uh, growth in the ASI. I'll be still positive. We are saying it's still going to be positive, but we're saying it's still uh, going to be way lower than what we did last year. We we'll also note that if you are tactical, if you are more active in the market, you would also outperform. So we encourage you to look at stocks uh, that are subject of restructuring, balance sheets restructuring, maybe it's restructuring in the sector. Uh, we are encouraged to look at stocks that, have, uh, that are experiencing some sort of a structural breaks from uh, previous uh, constraints. Philip and everybody, thank you so much from Cardinal Stone. Thank you so much for coming on the program this morning.